Okay, so J.J. Thompson in 1897 discovered the electron. So the idea is maybe electrons have something to do with bonds. You know, that's what, that's what brought Lewis into the game. But Thompson himself came up with what was, came to be called, and I don't know by who first, I've tried to find out and can't, the plum pudding atom. Has anyone ever heard of that? Yeah, okay. And I suspect that when people told you about the plum pudding atom, they sort of snickered. Am I right? That this was sort of a naive idea. It's not that naive at all. Let me show you what. Here's, here's the book by J.J. Uh, by, uh, Thompson called The Corpuscular Theory of Matter. And if you look in there, you'll find out what he's talking about. He says, he has a model of electron configuration. He says, consider the problem of how to arrange one, two, three, up to n corpuscles. That's what he called electrons. He called them corpuscles. Uh, consider the problem as to how they would arrange themselves if placed in a sphere filled with positive, electron, uh, uh, positive electricity of uniform density. So that's the idea of the plum pudding. You have this, this sphere of uniform positive density. Why it should be like that is not, nobody knows, but suppose you have a sphere. And you put the electrons in it like plums in a plum pudding, which is like a fruit cake in England, okay? Okay, now, notice that he said placed in a sphere filled with positive electricity. Why did he do that? Why didn't he just have, like Rutherford ultimately did, a, a nucleus, which is positive charge, and electrons around and about? Why did he put the electrons inside the positive charge? Zach? I can't hear very well. No? Yes? No, no, they weren't thinking about things moving. They want them just sitting there. Yeah, but that, that's well known, Coulomb's law. Yeah, Keith? Or uh, Kevin, right? Yeah, but that, that could be, if it, didn't, it wouldn't have to be a, a big sphere of uniform density. You could have a little particle of, of, of positive charge of the same charge, right? It'd be the same deal. Yeah. No, none of this is it. It's what we've just been talking about. Yeah, Claire? No, bonding hasn't come up yet. This is something very fundamental, yeah. <laughs> he probably liked plum pudding at Christmas, Did yeah. Did he have experimental evidence? Quite hit here. Did he have experimental evidence? No. Yeah. Aha, Earnshaw said you can't have an energy minimum for separate particles. But if you put the negative ones inside the positive one, then you can get a stable structure. It's Earnshaw's theorem that required it to be a plum pudding. Okay? Now, why a sphere? Why not a donut or, a, or some other shape, a barbell or something, right? And he said that the positive charge is distributed in a way most amenable to mathematical calculation. He chose a sphere so it would be simple. You know, you've heard about spherical cows and so on like that that physicists like to calculate. Let's suppose there's a cow, let it be a sphere, right? So that's what he did, that's why the, it's a sphere. Okay, we can solve the special case where the corpuscles are confined to a plane. If you can do it in two dimensions, it's difficult mathematically in three dimensions, but you can do it in two dimensions. And he gives a picture in this book, right, like this, which is a solenoid magnet that attracts little needles that are magnetized and those needles are stuck into corks which float in the water, right? So they have to, the corks have to stay at the level of the surface of the water, so it's a two-dimensional problem. The, the, the needles are parallel, the magnets, so they repel one another. But the big magnet attracts them to the center, okay? So what he does is toss a certain number of needles and corks in there and see what pattern they form, okay? So here are some patterns. You can get these on the webs at Greg Blonder's website here. 
So if you have just one, it goes to the center, no big deal. If you have two, you get a line. There's no big deal about that. Three make an equilateral triangle. Put in four, they make a square. Put in five, you make a pentagon. No one's surprised so far, I suspect. Except that sometimes when you put in five and shake it up, you get a square with one in the middle. Can you see where this might be going? Let's keep going, I'll see. OK, if you put in six, you get one inside a pentagon, seven, one inside a hexagon, eight, one inside a heptagon, right? Nine, two inside. 10, two inside, and sometimes it's like that, and sometimes it's like that. These are experimental, right? And if you put 11, it's three inside, and then three inside nine, although sometimes you get two, two pardon me, I, I'm screwing up here. Sometimes you get, there are two different patterns. You, sometimes you get three inside eight, sometimes you get two inside nine. Okay, for that number. Okay, and then you can get four inside nine, four inside ten, five inside ten. And then after five, if you put in more, than, if you put in 16, you get one inside five inside ten. What is this reminding you of? Yeah. The shell structure of atoms, right? As you go down the periodic table, you complete a shell. So it's a model of shells, right? And then you can get... Uh, more and more and more. Okay, so this is what Thompson was thinking about. But that's just two dimensions, right? Three dimensions is a bigger problem, but he could say, he was able to say something mathematically about eight. The equilibrium of eight corpuscles at the corners of a cube is unstable. Even if you have this spherical charge, so it's not exactly Earnshaw, still you can't get eight at the corners of a cube. Now, Lewis came, comes along, and in 1923, as I told you before, he writes, I have ever since regarded the cubic octet as representing essentially the arrangement of electrons in the atom. This is long after uh, Thompson had written this about not being able to do that. So, was Lewis ignorant of Earnshaw's theorem? Because by 1923, they know that the nucleus is not a plum pudding that, that is the positive sphere, that it's a point, right? So was Lewis just naive? No, look what he wrote in 1916. The electric forces between particles, which are very close together, do not obey the simple laws of inverse squares, which holds at greater distances. So Coulomb's law breaks down. You don't have inverse square. So then you don't have Earnshaw's theorem, and you don't have to worry, and you can get a structure if it's not an inverse square force law. Okay? No trouble, but what is the force law? Well, Thompson thought the same thing in 1923 in his book, The Electron on Chemistry. He wrote, if electron nuclear attraction were to vary strictly as the inverse square, we know by Earnshaw's theorem that no stable configuration is possible with the electrons at rest or oscillating about positions of equilibrium. I shall assume that the law of force between a positive charge and an electron is expressed by this equation. Then a number of electrons can be in equilibrium about a positive charge without necessarily describing orbits around it. And look at the, we're going to end right now by looking at this equation. What's that bit of it? The first bit, the one part. That's Coulomb's law. But he's got a correction to Coulomb's law here at the end, C over R. Where C is a distance, you divide it by R and you get a number, and C is a distance that's on the scale of atomic lengths, right? And that means that as long as C is, is, is very small, uh, pardon me, as long as, uh, uh, what, if I got this right, okay. So when distance R gets smaller than C, then the force changes sign. Okay. So what was attractive becomes repulsive, and then you can have the electrons sitting around the nucleus. Okay. So we'll see what happened three years later next time. Okay, so we saw last time that Lewis wasn't so dumb. He knew about Earnshaw's theorem, but he thought that, uh, so, but he still thought there was an octet of electrons around the nucleus.
How could he think such a thing? Because if you have inverse square force laws, you can't have a static positions of, of charged things unless they're right on top of one another or blown apart. So what did he think? That it's not an inverse square force law, that Coulomb's law breaks down when you get to very small scale. And J.J. Thompson thought the same thing and wrote here this two terms uh, here. The first one is that is Coulomb's law indeed, but there's this other thing, C over R, so as long as R is very big, you don't, compare about, you don't care about that term, right? As long as it's very big compared to C. And C is a distance that's something like the size of atoms. So once R, once the distance of the things that are interacting with one another, the electron and the nucleus, say, once they get near, near the distance C, then this, this uh, oh, sorry then this C over R thing becomes significant if R becomes very small, right? And it even changes the sign, right? So what was attractive becomes repulsive. So that would do okay then for a structure, right? That was in 1923. In 1926, just three years later, quantum mechanics came along and showed that Coulomb's law was just fine. Nothing wrong with Coulomb's law. It goes to much, 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 10 to the 20th, smaller distances than the size of atoms. Coulomb's law still works, right? What was wrong was the way they treated kinetic energy. Because kinetic energy, quantum mechanics, reformulates, so it gives you electron clouds. And so what's a cloud is not the positive charge. Remember, J.J. Thompson had a positive sphere of electricity in which he embedded the electrons. What's a cloud is the electrons and nuclei are put in it to make, at, to make molecules, right? So it's a, it really is, he was right about plum puddings. He just had the charges backwards. Not many people give him credit for that. So cubic octets of Lewis and ad hoc electrostatic force law like this C over R term in there soon disappeared from conventional chemistry and physics immediately, in fact, I mean within a month, say, okay? But the idea of shared pairs and lone pairs that Lewis came up with remained useful tools for discussing structure and bonding, right? So we still do them, and that's why you did problems today that had to do with that. Yes, Nico? Yeah, but I won't do it for a week still, because it takes a little while. 